All right, what up, y'all? Hey, it's Christmas season. Come on, let's go. Merry Christmas. Are you guys stressed out for finals? Like, I know it's also finals week, and yeah. Free A, that's what I'm talking about. I know Alex just said he's done with his finals. Hey, I know it's, I know it's final season, it's stress season. Man, we care about you guys. We're praying for you guys, get through your finals, but I hope you're enjoying the Christmas season as well. And, uh, and, and like Gabby said, we're continuing our fantasy series tonight, and, and we're going to talk about fantasy love and what fantasy love looks like. And, and, you know, when it comes to Christmas, um, I, think, I think we as a culture have forgotten again what Christmas is actually about. Because, you know, at first, like, you know, Christmas is about Jesus and like, you know, God coming to earth in the form of a man to die and take away all our sins, all that good stuff, right? But we forgot about that. And now it's about like Santa and presents and all that, right? But I actually think that we've forgotten again. And now apparently Christmas is all about love. Christmas is all about not, not like love, not, not like, you know, brotherly love, like romantic love. And, and, and this is what we see in our culture. And I uh, actually asked some celebrities to kind of share with us about that. So that, here's what uh, some of them have to say to you guys. I want to say, I think my favorite part of that whole video is Justin Bieber's movies, like, you know, like backing up into the street. <laughs> That's so good. Uh, but no, I mean, this, this shows that like our, cult- our culture around Christmas is all about love. And I think it reflects the fact that we all want love. Like we are looking for that fantasy love, right? And so that is what we're going to talk about tonight. We're going to talk about fantasy love and what does that look like. And, and actually what we're talking about is singleness. Because I think that singleness has a purpose and, and it's for us to really understand what fantasy love really looks like. And so that's what we're going to dig into tonight. We're going to look for that fantasy love. And, and here's the thing, like we tend to think singleness is second best, right? Like I, I think most people in the room would probably raise their hand and agree that single, they think, or singleness seems like second best, right? And I think we believe that because there's two lies. Uh, we boil it down to two lies that we ultimately believe. And the first lie is that singleness equals loneliness, Singleness equals loneliness. And, and here's what this sounds like. It's like, hey, Ryan, like, I just, I think I missed my shot. You know, like, I am, I am not married. I'm not dating anyone. I'm 23. Like, I'm going to be the crazy snake man, you know? And like, or, or a, a, an oldie but a goodie. Like, I'm going to die alone, right? Everybody says that. Or I think my favorite, like, I don't want to be alone on Christmas, Right? Or, I, hey, I just want somebody because I want to connect with someone on a deeper level. And look, like if you are saying that, like you already don't understand, you need to be connecting with friends on a deeper level, friends who know you, who know your real story, your real background, or walking through your hurts, your pains, your struggles, and helping you to know Jesus better and helping you to heal. That is what you need to connect with someone on a deeper level. And the second lie about singleness is that singleness equals purposelessness. Purposelessness. That's a lot of nesses. Uh, per- singleness equals purposelessness. And what it, what it sounds like is, hey, like, I don't have anybody depending on me, so it doesn't really matter what I do. Nobody, like, what I do isn't affecting anybody. Because I don't have a wife, I don't have kids, I don't have anybody to take care of, it doesn't matter. And so what it reflects, what it reflects in our lives is, hey, I'll take care of blank, whenever I'm married. Hey, I'll quit watching pornography when I get married. Hey, I will watch my diet whenever I get married. Hey, I will stop blowing a bunch of money at the casino, blowing half my paycheck at the casino once I'm married. And the reality is that you won't because you're training right now for a future moment. And if you're practicing those things, they will not just disappear whenever you get married. So singleness does have a purpose. We are training for a future. Um, but, but because of these two lies, most people see singleness as a waiting period, as a waiting room to get into the party of marriage. So in order to address these two lies, that singleness equals loneliness and that singleness equals purposelessness, I have one sentence that I want you guys to walk away with tonight. One sentence that I want you to believe and take action on. And that's this. Singleness is not second best, so make the most of your singleness. Singleness is not second best, so make the most of your singleness. That's what we're going to talk about tonight. And I'm going to break this down into two parts. We're going to just discuss the two different parts of this sentence. So we'll start with singleness is not second best. And to kick this off, I want to get everybody on the same page, right? Because I think that some people 
maybe most people in the room disagree with me that singleness is not second best. They're like, no, trust me, it's second best. Uh, but there's some people in the room who might agree with me. And so I just want to break that down. When I say singleness, I'm talking singleness and celibacy, sexless singleness, right? So no pornography, no masturbation, no, no body count, no build, no chasing girls or boys on the weekend. Like, because, because sex outside of God's design is harmful. And, 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 and God's design for sex is for a one man, one woman, husband and wife in a committed lifelong marriage. That is where sex belongs. And anything outside of that, pursuing sexual fulfillment and our singleness can be harmful, both psychologically and physically. And so when I say singleness, I'm talking about singleness without sexual fulfillment. All right, now that I've said that, hopefully you all disagree with me right now. Well, hopefully not, but you probably all disagree with me now that singleness is second best. So the question is, why do I have to convince you that singleness is second, not second best? Why do I have to convince you of that? Well, those two lies that we talked about. And, um, and, and, and really, like, I think the first truth is you want to have sex. All right, don't, don't elbow your friend. Don't hold your hand up, yell amen. Like, but the truth is we're young adults. Like we're, our bodies are wired that way. Like, don't lie to me. You want to have sex, all right? So you want to think that singleness is second best. And the second reason is that everything around us tells us that singleness is second best. Case in point, Ariana Grande had something to say about it. Justin Bieber had something to say about it. Or movies, go, walk a, go watch a Hallmark movie and tell me I'm wrong, all right? Or your church. I mean, the, the sad reality is that many churches, the church around the world at large has mishandled this topic of singleness and they have treated single adults as though they are less than married adults, as though they're in a waiting room because marriage is better. And so that may be part of your history or maybe what you saw growing up in your church, but it's not true. And of course, then there's grandma telling us that singleness is second best. I don't know, did anybody go home for Thanksgiving and get the line like, hey, when are you going to show up here with somebody? Like, don't come back to my family party without bringing somebody with you, right? Like, that's why we believe singleness is second best, but it's not true. And this, I'm going to make a biblical case for this because what you may not know is the Bible actually talks directly to this topic. Um, there, there's two people, uh, probably the most impactful people uh, on Christianity. Definitely one is because it's Jesus, right? Uh, he's God. He is the single most imp impactful person who's walked the earth. And Jesus talks about singleness. And also there's Paul, who I, I say Paul is the most impactful Christian missionary um, in history. Right, because Paul, Paul lived a life of singleness and celibacy and his whole goal once he came to know the gospel in Jesus was to get as many people to know about Christianity, about following Christ, the good news of his salvation as he possibly could. And so we're going to look at what these two guys have to say about singleness. And we're going to first look at what Jesus has to say because Jesus is going to support this point that singleness is not second best. And we're going to look in Matthew. Matthew is one of the four gospels. It's one of the four accounts of Jesus's life as a living, breathing, walking, talking human being here on earth, right? And so this is a story when, uh, you know, we're going to set the scene. Jesus is walking around, teaching everybody, blowing people's minds. And so they're just like, he, he's got his disciples, his squad, but then there's these, the religious teachers of the Jews at the time. And they, these people do not like Jesus because Jesus is rocking their boat because they've got, they had a monopoly on understanding God and they had all the power because of it. And then Jesus comes in and tells them they're wrong. They don't like him very much. And so the Pharisees are always trying to trip Jesus up and trying to get him to say something wrong. That's like their whole goal is to destroy Jesus because they don't like what he's doing. And so we got, we got like, picture this. It's like, a, like an old Western, right? So like on one side, we got the Pharisees and they're like, hey, you know, what up, Jesus? We got a, we got a uh, question for you. And then you got Jesus over here. And he's like, all right, guys, like I just was trying to go to lunch, but sure, what you got, you know? And, and behind Jesus are his disciples and they're standing there and they're like, you know, they like got that whole my dad can beat up your dad mentality, you know? And so that's, that's the scene that we're looking at here. And, and what, the, uh, what the Pharisees asked Jesus, they're like, hey, so can a, is it legal for a man to divorce his wife for any reason? And Jesus is like, no. Uh, God, he says, when you get married, God said that when you get married, the man and the woman become one. And God said that what God has joined together, let man not separate. So no. And the Pharisees are like, bro, I knew he was going to say that. We got him. Listen to this. All right. And he goes, so Jesus, why then did Moses say that a man can issue his wife a certificate of divorce? And Jesus is like, so, so what this is, this is a juke, right? So like, if I'm standing here and I'm like, man, I love America. I just really believe in America. 
and I say something and you're like, well, that's funny. Why, why did you just say something that's opposite of what Abraham Lincoln said? And I'd be like, whoa, hold up, what? Because that's who Moses was to the Jews is he's like the Abraham Lincoln of their history. He brought the people out of slavery in Egypt. Like he's a huge person, uh, very important to the Jews. And so, so that's basically what they just did. They just juked him, called Abraham Lincoln on him. And, and so Jesus is about to drop a bomb on them and just, just uh, drop a truth bomb. And so he's like, Moses allowed you to divorce because he knew how sinful you guys were and how messed up you were. But here's the reality, and I'm going to pick up in uh, chapter 19, verse 9, where Jesus says, he says, I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for marital unfaithfulness, cheating, and marries another woman commits adultery. Boom. Bombshell. Mic drop. Everybody's like, what? That was really intense. So he's saying like, hey, unless... You're, okay, it's talking to the man, but it applies either case. Unless your spouse sexually cheats on you, if you divorce that person and go and get remarried and have sex, then it's divorce. That's what he said, or it's uh, adultery. That's what he's saying here. And everybody's like, what? And so listen to the disciples. I love their reaction. It says the disciples said, it, so, so notice the disciples said to him, at first it was the Pharisees asking questions. The disciples said to him, if this is the situation between a husband and a wife, it is better not to marry. So I want you to picture this because like, you know, the disciples are like standing behind him. You know, they're like, yeah, you know, my dad's tougher than you. And then Jesus says this and, and they're like, whoa, 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 hold up, hold up, Jesus. Like, back up, guys. I got a question. And they're like, I know marriages that are tough. They're like, I've seen people need to go to marital counseling. I've seen couples that have money problems. I've seen people drag crazy big issues into their marriage. And you're telling me that there's no way out? And they're like, hold up. But like, it would be better not to get married if I, if I don't have a way out. Is that what you're saying? And Jesus, <laughs> I love Jesus. He's standing there and he's like, uh, yeah. Like, he's like, you said it. I didn't say it. Don't blame me. That, that's his answer. He, he says, oh man, I lost my page. Um, he says, not everyone can accept this word, but only those to whom it has been given. That's the, yeah, that's the shrug. The shrug. I mean, yeah, you're right. And he goes on and he says, for some are eunuchs because they were born that way. A eunuch is a man who doesn't have his junk. Um, so they were born that way for, due to some physical deformity or others were made that way by men. So some had their uh, genitals cut off for purposes of slavery, kind of crazy Crazy, nasty stuff. Um, so some are eunuchs for, by, because they were born that way. Others were made that way. And then he says others have renounced marriage, or he's saying live like eunuchs, i.e. live single, because of the kingdom of heaven. The one who can accept this should accept it. So Jesus just confirmed that singleness is not second best. He just said, like, yeah, if it's going to be that hard for you to not divorce, then, yeah, you shouldn't get married. And so that, that's what he's saying tonight. And don't hear Jesus saying that singleness is best and marriage is not because he loves marriage. He created marriage. Marriage is awesome. But he's not saying that marriage is better than singleness. He's confirming singleness is not second best. And, uh, and so now we're going to take a look at Paul, what Paul has to say, which, like I said, Paul, most, most effective Christian missionary of all time, um, he wrote this letter to the Christians in the city of Corinth, it's called First Corinthians, get it? And he wrote multiple letters, so this one's the first one. Um, and so this is what he says. Paul kind of continues this discussion about singleness is not second best. And this is what he says. He says, so again, Paul was single. And so he, he's talking about his singleness. He says, I wish that all men were as I am, which is single. But each man has his own gift from God. One has this gift, another has that gift. Now to the unmarried and the widows, I say, it is good for them to stay unmarried as I am. So did you catch that? Paul literally just explicitly said, it is good to remain unmarried. So in case you didn't think I was telling the truth, like he just said it. He just outright said it. It is good to remain unmarried. He didn't say it's okay to remain unmarried. It's acceptable to remain unmarried. He said it's good to remain unmarried. But what's more important that I want you to see is, did you see that he called it a gift? He called singleness a gift. And it's Christmas season, right? So you guys all know, like, say your friend walks up to you. He's like, hey, man, I got you a present. And you're like, oh, sweet. And it's like wrapped all super nice. And it's got this super legit bow on it. You're like, oh, awesome. And you open it up. And inside the gift, it's singleness. <laughs> and you're like, bro, like, take it back. I don't want it. Is there a receipt with this gift? Give me a gift card or something. I don't want it. <clears throat> 
But singleness is a gift. Singleness is a gift, and we're going to look into why. It's, it's the gift that will allow us to come to know the true fantasy love. And that's what we're going to take a look at here. And so what, what Paul goes on to say later on in this chapter, he says, But those who marry will face many troubles in this life. And I want to spare you this. He's saying, what he's saying is that, hey, like marriage is hard. Marriage is hard. And you know what? When you're single, there's some truth to that little lie that single equals purposelessness, right? Because in that we think, well, nobody's depending on me. I can do whatever I want. There's a little shred of that, of truth in that. Because you know what? When Hurricane Katrina hits, if you're single, you request days off from work. You can get in your car and drive down to New Orleans and you can help people in need. You can go and feed people. You can help get people out. You can just pick up and go. But all of a sudden, when you get married, you have a new calling that God has called you to, all right? And it's a good thing. He created you to do that. But your family becomes your number one priority. Husband and wife, your job is to care for the other, care for the kids. And so you don't have the ability to just do whatever you think you're going to do, whatever God's calling you to, because God's already called you to a higher calling, which is to take care of your family. So marriage is hard. Singleness gives you the freedom to do whatever God is calling you to do. And if you think that marriage will cure your loneliness, your expectations of marriage are too high and marriage cannot handle the weight of those expectations. You will carry that loneliness into your marriage and expect your spouse to cure it. And then every time they let you down and they will let you down, you're going to feel hurt. You're going to feel jealous and you're going to feel lonely. Lonely marriage does not cure loneliness. And if your expectation is that, your expectation is too high. And so singleness is not about waiting. It's about discovering the gift and finding what fantasy love really looks like. And so to conclude that point, singleness is not second best. Jesus and Paul both just taught us that. If you believe in those two most effective people, maybe in the Bible, then you believe what they said. So let's go on to the second statement. <clears throat> singleness is not second best, so make the most of your singleness. Let's continue with what Paul has to say and, and see how he's going to explain this idea of make the most for your, of your singleness. <clears throat> he says in verse 32, I would like you to be free from concern. An unmarried man is concerned about the Lord's affairs, how he can please the Lord. But a married man is concerned about the affairs of, his, of, the, of this world. How can he please his wife? And his interests are divided. And then he goes on to say the same thing to women. An unmarried woman or virgin is concerned about the Lord's affairs. Her aim is to be devoted to the Lord in both body and spirit. But a married woman is concerned about the affairs of this world. How she can please her husband. And so he basically just made the same case that I was making to you, is that, is that once you get into marriage, you have another priority, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to pull. You can't just go. You can't just get up and go whenever you see a need. And so he finishes this by saying, I am, not, or I am saying this for your own good, not to restrict you, but that you may live in a right way in undivided devotion to the Lord. And that's it. Singleness is a gift because you can live an undivided devotion to the Lord. So what does that look like? What does it look like to live an undivided devotion to the Lord? What is God calling you to do? Well, I pulled, pulled three things out of Scripture that, that are very clear. And you can, you can go study and find a lot of things. But one thing is to love your neighbor. Right, like Jesus tells us the parable of the Good Samaritan, which I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna talk about in detail. You can go look it up. You've probably heard it before. But where this guy, uh, you know, he helps another guy who's been beaten and robbed, and he helps heal him, and he he steps away from his schedule. He probably misses some appointments, and he's supposed to hate this guy. Like it's it's from a rival country, and he's supposed to hate him, but he steps out of his way to help him. Like we're called to step aside from our schedule, to step aside from our likes and dislikes and love the neighbor. Our neighbor is anyone who's put in front of us who has a need. It's not just who lives next to you, right? So love your neighbor. The second thing that God is calling us to do is care for the poor, care for the orphan, care for the widow. I heard a statistic recently that single moms, 53% 53 of single moms are on welfare. 
that's kind of crazy. Like, and, and I'm not saying, man, like we're called to care for those people. And I'm not saying that we're called to make the government care for those people. We're called to care for them on our own. Like if you run into that person, if that person's in your life, manage your money in a way that you can help them out, right? And the third thing is share the gospel, right? Jesus told us like, go into all the world, share the gospel, baptize people in my name and like let them know about the salvation that comes from what I just did on the cross. We are called to go and share that message with other people. But instead, we waste our time on entertainment after entertainment after entertainment. Did you know that on average, by the time he's 21, the average American male has played 10,000 hours of video games? 10,000 hours. It takes half that time to get a bachelor's degree. Malcolm Gladwell came out with this book a while back saying that 10,000 hours is the number that it takes to generally become proficient or excellent at something. It, it, I, I was a tennis player, right? And like, if I had been able to, I put a lot of time into tennis. If I had been able to put 10,000 hours into tennis, I probably wouldn't have been riding the bench through college. I probably would have been in the starting lineup competing for my team. 10,000 hours gaming. And man, like the, the problem, it's not, it's not gaming that's the problem. If you like to game, game, but do it responsibly. Spend a reasonable amount of time on it. The question is what's consuming your life? For, for the girls, it's probably not as many of you who are spending that much time on video games. But is it, is it binge watching some streaming service or is it scrolling hours through your phone, comparing yourself unintentionally, I get it, but still comparing yourself to what you see on there and making sure your profile is perfect? Guys, you do it too. Like what's consuming your life? Man, the reality is the world out there is on fire. Man, there are, there are women being sold into sex slavery Women, there are, your peers are choosing to terminate their pregnancy because they feel safest going to the place that's, that's helping them do that instead of turning to you. Get out into the world, man. Stop trying to conquer a fantasy world, a make-believe world, and go heal the real one. Make the most of your singleness. But the thing is, it doesn't have to be heroic. It doesn't have to be heroic. For me, man, like what this looked like was a guy named Blake Area, who was a youth leader for me when I was in youth group in church, right? Blake was a college student who chose to drive two hours and spend his time in my youth group leading young guys and young girls. I was a 16-year-old. I got really close with Blake. And you know what? Like Blake showed me, he painted a vision for who and what I wanted to be and how I wanted to be five years into the future. I, I saw in Blake what I wanted to become. And I saw what it looked like to make the most of your singleness. And you know what? I don't remember a single piece of advice he gave me. But, I, but he showed me the way that I wanted to go. And Blake, because Blake made the most of his singleness, I look back and I'm, I'm, I'm pretty joyful with the way that I used my singleness in my young adulthood. I was single for 12 years, 18 to 30, all right? I just started into a relationship. And, and man, like, I got to mentor I'm trying to think of the number, maybe hundreds, maybe between 100 and 200 high schoolers into college and then walk through that difficult transition. And then through college, I got to mentor them doing youth ministry. I have like eight years of experience doing youth ministry. And I don't say that to brag, man, but I want you to have a vision for what it can look like. I got to go on mission trips to serve the poorest of the poor in Guatemala, Jamaica and Mexico, alongside my high schoolers, to show them a world that they didn't even know existed and to serve people who have absolutely nothing. And, and I got to learn how to manage my money in a responsible way so that I was able to help a struggling mom one time who couldn't pay bills because she was sick and couldn't make it to work. And I was able to pay her bills so she was able to put food on the table for the kids. Again, I'm not trying to brag. I'm just telling you what it can look like. I'm telling you what you can do with your singleness. And man, the vineyard right now, this church, the building that you're sitting in, the people who own this building, like we're sponsoring a program. There's a school, Madison Elementary on Wheeling Island. There's elementary school kids there, man, who, who have a very bleak looking future. And they don't have a lot of good role models to look up to. And there's a program where you can go be a reading mentor to them, or we're also going to put on a basketball camp and you can be a coach. You know what? Like you're, by doing that, like you're going to give them skills that will last a lifetime. I can't 
overstress the value of getting them on level, on grade level with reading. But you know what is even more important? Is you can give those kids a picture, a vision of what they want to be like 10 years from now. And that can, is irreplaceable. And if it's not that, man, like if, if you don't know where to start, or no matter what, like get plugged into a church and start serving in a church. If you love kids, go do kids ministry, man. And, and side note, like men, there is nothing more attractive to a woman than a 22-year-old dude who's getting dogpiled by six-year-olds, all right? Like if you're trying to find a godly woman, that's a good place. Um, but man, or if you look back at your middle school years or your high school years and you're like, gosh, man, I was so like directionless. I needed somebody to help me. I got stuck in porn. I got stuck in drugs. I, I got stuck in you name it. If you look back at that and you want that, then go be that for somebody. Go and do that. Go do youth ministry, man. Or, or if you, instead you're more creative, like get involved in a production team and create an unbelievable worship experience for people who show up at church on Sunday morning. Wherever your gifting is, like, man, go serve your community. <laughs> and, and one more thing, man, like go do your work well at your job or at your school. Glorify God with the way you work because you know what? I get the opportunity to stand up here every couple of weeks and share the gospel with you with a microphone plastered to my face, right? I get to talk about what it looks like to follow Jesus. But you know where I can't go? I can't go to the warehouse at Cabela's where your coworkers are loading up boxes. I can't get into the locker room of the football team at Willing University. I can't get into the rec center at, we, at West Lib, but you can. You were placed on purpose for a purpose. There's a reason that you are where you are. And if you're making the most of your singleness, your eyes are up, your eyes are focused out, you're looking at the people around you and seeing where you can meet needs, seeing where you can share and love them. So I'm gonna close here tonight, guys. The reality, I think that you might feel like you need a deep breath because you're still afraid that you're gonna die alone. <sighs> the reality is that most of you are going to get married, all right? Statistically, it's just, it's just a fact, like most of us are going to end up married. We're not gonna spend our whole lives single. Some of you will, but for the most part, you're going to get married. Most of you are going to get married. And, and the point of that is that singleness is a season for you. It's not a lifelong situation, it's a season. And what I don't want for you is to be in marriage and look back at your singleness and regret wasting it. Regret missing out on all that God had for you and, and learning what his love for others and for, for you looks like. See, I want you to think about what, like, what stories do you want to tell your kids? Do you want to be Ted Mosby and, and tell your kids of the stories of all your sexual conquests and chasing girls for like eight to ten years before you found their mother? Like, I don't want to tell the stories of my kids about how I dragged a pornography addiction through my 20s or about the period when I was partying and getting drunk on the weekends. I will because I don't want them to have the scars that I have at 31. But man, what I'm more excited about is telling the story about how my Bible study walked around downtown Tulsa every week looking for homeless people and said, hey man, what's your name? Can I take you to dinner? I want to hear your story. Those are the stories I'm excited to tell my kids about. And that's what I want for you guys. That's what making the most of your singleness looks like. You need to get okay with being single. And I think that people get confused when I say that because they think, well, if I get okay with being single, then God's gonna give me the fantasy guy or he's gonna bring me the fantasy girl. But that's not what I'm saying because that says if I'm good enough, then God will repay me for being good. And that's not how it works. What I'm saying is if you get okay being single, then you can walk into marriage more prepared and marriage won't disappoint you from unrealistic expectations. There's a, a pastor named Jonathan Pecluda that I've been following for years. He's wrote some really amazing books for young adults. Highly recommend if you want to look him up. But he always says, uh, I've heard him say multiple times, like, hey, I've counseled hundreds of young adult married couples. And he goes, you know what I always deal with? I always deal with single people problems. We don't talk about married people problems because what we're facing is that people dragging their single people problems into marriage and making their spouse deal with it. So that singleness is a season to make the most of. And when we are okay with it, when we've dealt with our, with our problems, when we're facing those down, and we don't have to be perfect, but when we're facing those down, I think we're more prepared for marriage. 
the, the last lie that I want to confront is, hey man, I, I want a girlfriend or I want a boyfriend because I just want to be loved. Man, you are loved. You are loved. See, Jesus said that, hey, there is no greater love than this than to lay down your life for a friend. And that's what he did for you. That is what he did for you. He loved you so much. He loves you more than you can possibly comprehend. He came and lived a life that was perfect, that did not deserve a death, so that he could die the death that you deserve for the things that you've done, for the, for the sin that you have lived in. He loves you more than you can possibly, possibly comprehend. Jesus is the fantasy love that you've been looking for. Man, I want you guys to understand that the gospel is the greatest cause you can get behind. Because whether you're working at a rehab clinic or you're helping out single moms or you're working at Madison Elementary mentoring kids, the reality is that when you understand the gospel, you know that, that you're broken. I'm broken. I'm too broken to fix myself. I've tried and I've failed and I don't need a second chance. <laughs> I don't need another second chance. I need a savior. And when you're there serving those people, you can look at the, because you know what? You're going to find broken people just like you. And you can look them in the eye and say, hey, I'm broken too. But I know someone who can fix you. I know who, someone who can take your story and take your brokenness and he can make it beautiful. Let me tell you about this savior. You don't need another second chance. I can tell you about him. And if that's new to you, if you haven't heard of this, if you want to know more about the gospel, come find me. I would love to share it with you. I would love to talk more about it, related to your story, related to mine. Come find me afterwards. That'd be awesome. But I just want to say, live your singleness different because singleness is not second best. And so make the most of it. Live different. Singleness is not second best because God's love is not second best. And he is a fantasy love that you've been looking for. Let me pray and then we're gonna sing some songs. Jesus, we just thank you for this night. We thank you for Christmas. We thank you that what it's really all about is that you came to earth to pay for our sins 32 years later. I thank you for singleness, God. I thank you for, for 12 years of singleness in my life. I thank you for every moment of singleness in every person's life in this room, Lord. Because whether we've done it right or whether we've missed out a little bit, you had something to teach us. And I thank you for that. And I pray that you would inspire us tonight to, to know you and to serve you and to follow you and to, and to make the most of our singleness through that, Lord, to love the people around us with reckless, crazy love. Lord, to be focused on others before we're focused on ourselves. Lord, and I pray you would prepare us for marriage and that we would see that vision as well. God, I just pray over finals in this week of stress that, that you would be peace in the hearts of every young man and young woman who's taking finals this week, that you would bring success, that you'd help them to recall the things they've learned this semester and get through this week and enjoy a month of break with their families and friends. And for those of us who are at work, just bless this season. Help us to bless our coworkers. Help us to love the people around us, God. In your name we pray, amen.